Okay, we're continuing our unit on medicine and drugs, and we're going to be discussing drug action during the screencast. At the end of the screencast, you should be able to describe the importance of geometric isomerism in drug action, the importance of chirality in drug action, of the beta lactam ring action of penicillin, and the increased potency of dimorphine, also known as heroin, compared to morphine. Okay, so the, the question to keep in mind is how does the chemical structure of a drug determine its mode of action? And we'll be looking at three examples. Stereoisomerism, ring strain, solubility, and uptake. And the first one we're going to take a look at is the stereoisomerism. If you recall, there are two different types, geometric isomers and optical, optical, okay. optical isomers. Okay. The geometric, if you remember, are the cis and trans isomers. And these exist um, when there is restricted rotation around a bond okay, or around an atom. Right? And then optical, optical isomers exist when there is a asymmetric carbon atom, meaning four different things attached to a carbon atom. Um, asymmetrical or asymmetric carbon atom. And we'll be looking at examples of these um, in these in the screencast. Okay, so the first thing to look at is going to be a geometric isomer. Okay, and we're going to look specifically at cisplatin. This is used in the treatment of cancer. You can see the cis form here with the same groups on the same side. Um, it is a square planar molecule. It's a transition complex ion, if you note, with an overall charge of uh, neutral. All right, this would be your trans isomer. The cis one is the one that is actually active. Okay. Um, this cisplatin is used in the treatment of cancer, particularly testicular and ovarian cancer, among others. It targets the DNA of the mutated cells, and it prevents those cells from replicating. Oh, sorry, my cat came and stepped on my... on my computer. All right, so how does this cisplatin work? Well, if we draw a quick <coughs> drawing of this again, we have the platinum oops, dear me, uh, with the um, chlorine, chlorine, and then your ammonium, I'm sorry, your ammonia and your ammonia, ammonia ligands, right? When you react this with water, these chlorides are replaced with water. Okay, and that can either be replaced, um, one of them, which gives you a uh, complex ion with a plus one charge, or it could replace both of those chloride ions. And remember, with this complex ion, you're using the a lone pair from the ligand to bond with that uh, transition metal. Okay, So you can have one of these two uh, products. This is the most reactive of the two possible products. Okay, So how does this work? It replaces those two chlorides with water and then these two things um, bond with the DNA of the um,
cell. Um, and it um, prevents that cell from replicating. Okay, and if you notice that the cis version of this complex ion is really the only one that is going to be physically oriented such that it can react with that DNA from the cell. Now a chiral drug is going to react a little differently in an enzyme and this is due to its chirality. <coughs> Okay, if this is a um, similar to what I think is shown in your book, you have, remember, two enantiomers when you have a chiral um, molecule. Your active enantiomer is going to line up with the site. The inactive, no matter how you rotate it, is not going to line up. So your chiral um, drug is going to have one active enantiomer and one that is inactive. Okay. And this might explain a little bit better why chiral drugs are so important um, because either they line up with the drug binding site or, or, they, or they don't. One chiral drug that the IB uh, uses as an example is thalidomide. There is the R thalidomide. Remember the R and the S has to do with how it rotates the plane of light. Um, the R enantiomer is sleep inducing and um, was originally used for morning sickness. This was mentioned earlier in the unit as well. Unfortunately, the enantiomer is a um, it causes birth defects. Um, this was originally prescribed as a mix and they thought that um, once it was found out that birth defects were caused by the other enantiomer of this chiral drug, it was thought that they could just purify it for the R version, basically take all of this enantiomer out, but they found that um, this will metabolize in the body and actually produce this one so while it was a good idea, in, in reality, it didn't work. Thalidomide is also then um, responsible for increased testing of stereoisomers before they're used in the drug market to make sure that the side effects of both the intended drug and its enantiomer are studied and that there aren't um, issues with either one before it's produced to be used. Ibuprofen is also a stereo-optical molecule. Um, its S form is active. The R form uh, is inert, meaning it doesn't do much and you just pass it through the body. And the S is actually metabolized to the R, so purifying doesn't make any sense. Um, but since it's not harmful, it's not that big of a deal. Um, you do have to be able to identify the chiral center for ibuprofen. And hopefully if you're looking at it, Sorry, jeez. If you're looking at it, you would notice that this is the chiral center for ibuprofen. Okay, so that's one thing that you would be able or be required to do for um, the IB is to point out the chiral center. And what you're looking for is really four different groups connected to a carbon. I'm going to stop here. Okay, so 
Moving on to our next example, we're going to talk about ring strain and how that chemical structure of a drug determines its mode of action. If you remember, we talked about ring strain in the beta, beta lactam. Um, again, this is your four member ring. Carbon would prefer to have either an sp3, which is 109.5 degree, or an sp2, which is 120 degree. Um, because this square has that at a 90 degree, there is a lot of ring strain in here, and that would um, account for the reactivity of penicillin um, with that ring being that unstable and that easy to break. Okay, so penicillin actually interacts with the active site in transpeptidase. It's an, that's an enzyme involved in building the cell walls. That ring is going to open and it allows penicillin to bind irreversibly to that enzyme and it makes that um, inactive. Um, so it weakens that cell wall, um, it absorbs water, and then it bursts and ends up dying. Okay, and then the last one is going to be solubility and uptake, meaning how is it brought into the body. If you remember, our bodies are mostly water, so many drugs are polar, remembering that likes dissolve likes. Polar substances tend to dissolve in polar solvents. This one exception is the blood-brain barrier. How do we get medicines into the brain? Well, part of the strategy is to design more non-polar drugs, or at least drugs that have more nonpolar um, sections. And this is going to allow them to better penetrate that blood brain barrier and let them get into the blood let them get into the brain from the blood. Okay, so if we take a look at the example, and this should be an example that you know, if we look at morphine, we have these hydroxyl groups making this um, pretty polar, okay, and not able to very effectively cross that blood-brain barrier. So not able to very effectively cross that blood-brain barrier. But if we replace those polar groups, those OH, with these functional groups, these esters, okay, these esters are, are less polar and therefore able to pass that barrier more readily and get into the blood and then work at being in between those blood, um, those brain cells to affect the pain. Um, and it is interesting that this uh, diamorphine, also known as heroin, is about twice as effective as um, morphine. Now, it's twice as effective perhaps in the intended effect. It is also amplifies the side effects such as tolerance and dependency. So you kind of get the good with the bad, right? So again, those lo less polar ester groups on heroin allow the heroin to more easily cross the blood-brain barrier. And it's interesting that once in the brain, heroin is converted back to morphine by esterases. Okay, and, and so it's really the action in the brain is the same as morphine. It's just because of the ability to cross that barrier, you get more of the drug into the brain faster. And that ends the screencast on drug action.